Ladies and gentlemen of the Sir Walter Scott Club of Edinburgh, a great pleasure to be asked by the club to review the process whereby we abridged, or rather epitomised, the great novel of Ivanhoe, Sir Walter Scott's great yarn, great story of uh, early medieval England. The story behind the novel itself is, is interesting too. By the time that he came to write it, around 1819, Scott had covered Scotland in four previous novels and was fearful that the Scottish genre, the Scottish language, the landscape, all the descriptions of this country, which had gone into Waverley, uh, Guy Mannering and the other novels which began the series, that he, he felt he was running out of steam. And he felt perhaps it might be sensible to go abroad, to go south of Hadrian's Wall and go back centuries into the early medieval period and discuss an event or events in England. And that's exactly what he did with Ivanhoe. Back in the 15th century, Ivanhoe was an estate owned by John Hampden, a famous figure in English political history, um, who was unfortunate enough to hit the Black Prince accidentally with his tennis racket when they were playing a game of royal tennis. And in uh, payment of the fine, as it were, for having assaulted the heir to the throne, he gave up Ivanhoe. There's a poem about it which you will see in the book itself. But this was to take the story back even further uh, through Walter Scott. And back to the 12th century and the reign of King Richard the Lionheart, and followed by his brother John, in which the novel is set. The process of adjusting the novel, that is, uh, redacting it, if you like, or epitomizing it, or compressing it for a modern audience, was first suggested to me uh, in America at, at Harvard when we were having a meeting on English literature. And I was being interrogated as to why it was that t two of Scotland's greatest writers, David Hume, the philosopher and historian, and Sir Walter Scott, the novelist and poet, were very little read by the population back home in Scotland. The problem with uh, David Hume is that his language is very different from that of today. Uh, he was much older than Scott, of course, but the change in grammar, syntax, and punctuation renders his writings uh, difficult to read. With Scott, it's rather different. Scott's language is good. Scott's grammar, syntax, and punctuation are fine. He's just rather long. And in fact, the discussion at the university in America ended with their professor of literature saying to me, what is the major problem with Scott that you've found? And I said, well, sir, in my view, the major problem is the hardback covers of his books. And the, the hall went quite quiet, and uh, my colleague said, the hardback covers? What's wrong with them? I said, they're too far apart. And in fact, the problem was just that, as we repeatedly heard from the younger generation here, that it's not good enough nowadays for the action to begin on page 32. It really has to begin on page one. So that began the process after discussion uh, with the editor of Ivanhoe for the Edinburgh edition of the Waverley novels, the definitive work on the text. Uh, and we discussed the fact that it might be possible to shorten the novel by removing extraneous matter from Scott's uh, text, while keeping the patient alive, as it were, uh, by keeping alive the storyline and the uh, the plot line, which are the living parts of the novel. And in fact, all that reminded me very much of my 35 years in my surgical speciality in medicine, because the duty of the surgeon in the operating room is to remove the extraneous matter while keeping the patient alive and avoiding hemorrhage and avoiding loss in our case of, uh, uh, of blood, but in the literary sense, loss of plot line and evolution of character uh, and the story. So that's what we began to do. And I removed a huge number of commas and semicolons, etc. I shortened paragraphs and I shortened uh, sentences. Uh, I think I removed more colons than any of my colleagues in abdominal surgery. And the result was to bring Ivanhoe down from uh, 185,000 words in the original to the 95,000 in the redacted novel. And the other th great joy of doing this work was to see how clever Scott had been to recapture the language and the sights, the sounds and the smells of medieval England. Both Garth the Swineherd 
uh, and Wamba the Jester are furnished by Scott with a delightfully dry sense of humour. And, and their reactions to and association with their master, Cedric of, uh, of Rotherwood, uh, is one of the joys of the novel itself. But also keeping the context together of the relationship between the Norman barons, including Front de Boeuf, for example, or the, or the Templar, Brian de Bois-Gilbert, who sinks to fathomless depths of dastardliness as they put in the, in the novel, in comparison to the Saxon hero, who of course is Ivanhoe himself, Sir Wilfred of Ivanhoe, to give him his correct title. Uh, that is one of the other joys, where as the, the novel moves from conflict to conflict, Norman versus Saxon, Freeman versus outlaw, Jew versus Gentile, and in that context, we should remember that one of Scott's most, ex most successful female characterizations is shown here. Uh, uh, Rebecca of York, the daughter of Isaac, is a true female intellectual and is beautifully per portrayed by Scott uh, in that role. Another of the great joys of Ivanhoe is Scott's tremendous command of medieval language uh, literature uh, and indeed the vocabulary of chivalry. Scott was a great exponent of the chivalric tradition uh, of the Middle Ages uh, and in the novel we see very carefully set out the language of the tournament, of the jousting, of the lists as Ivanhoe takes on the Normans at the famous tournament at Ashby de la Zouche, that passage of arms in chapter 8 of Ivanhoe which is so well described uh, by Scott. And the images which you're seeing now of the various combatants, Ivanhoe himself, Bois-Gilbert, Front de Boeuf, uh, add up to a tremendous climax as Ivanhoe himself is badly injured and is led from the field in the care of Rebecca and her father. And so there we are in general terms about the text of the novel, but one other factor in its redaction um, or its epitomization, if you like, as we have done, was the fact that Scott uses terminology and allusions, both classical and literary and otherwise, which were certainly not known to the generality of the population today. I think I put in between three and four hundred footnotes into Ivanhoe to explain to a modern audience what exactly Scott was meaning with Latin tags and French uh, medieval references. And just one for example, I remember that when King Richard the Lionheart is wandering through the forest, not sure where he's going to find accommodation for that night, he, he, he prays carefully and correctly to St. Julian. And St. Julian was the saint to whom one prayed, looking for B&B &B that night, for that particular night. And I remember the, uh, the footnote having to say, he is praying to St. Julian, the patron saint of travelers needing accommodation on the night in question, whereas St. Uh, uh, Christopher handles all routine travelers' inquiries. So I had great enjoyment and some uh, humour put into the footnotes to explain to the population exactly what is going on here. And so in summary, as far as the text is concerned, the, the problem which uh, we faced uh, was to try to absolve Scott of the charges uh, of a modern audience in that he is rather too long, that the paragraphs are overlong, that the sentences themselves go on for far more words than is normal in a current novel, with, the, almost, with quite frequently the verb in Germanic for, for, format coming at the end of the sentence. So what I did in many cases was to shorten the paragraphs and the sentences, removing many of the interspersed punctuations, and often removing the double adjectives. Scott often uses two adjectives when only one is necessary, and adjectival singularity was the, was the order of the day. The, the language itself is very similar to modern English, although we must remember that Scott, in just four decades' time, will have been born 300 years ago. And the English language is a living thing. It moves on. It evolves in a Darwinian sense. There are extinctions. There are new arrivals. But there are not all that many in Ivanhoe, despite the fact that we're dealing with the early medieval period in England. And so the syntactical changes uh, were the centerpiece of the changes made to the, to the novel itself. The reduction in word length uh, came down to 95,000 words uh, against about 195 
thousand in the original. Ivanhoe was extremely successful when it was published in, in 1819 and I'm pleased to say that the reception of the uh, adapted book has been similarly uh, well received uh, with sales particularly at Abbotsford itself having been uh, very gratifying. Particularly I was delighted to hear from Graham Tullough, Professor of English Literature at Flinders University uh, in South Australia at Adelaide that he thoroughly approved of the attempt to redact the novel, in other words, to, to encourage the modern and younger generation more used to social media and to electronic communications, which were not available in, in, in Scott's time, of course, to bring them to terms with the novel itself, starting on page one and keeping together the storyline, plot line and character development, which is the, uh, the essence of any great novel. I was also very pleased to have a comment, which I think we put onto the cover of the book, from Alexander McCall Smith, uh, saying in summary that this is just what is needed to reintroduce Sir Walter Scott to the modern audience. He deserves to be read, he deserves to be appreciated, he was our greatest novelist. But I suppose that looking back, one might just make the comparison with automotive vehicles. What we have with Ivanhoe and with Waverley and Guy Mannering and the early novels, we see the very genesis, the very origin of the historical novel. Because Scott, remember, was worthy of his place in the premier division of the Enlightenment by actually bringing to birth a new concept in literature. And that is you might put fictional characters into a known historical landscape and build up what we now call the historical novel. But just like an old car, compared to a modern one, a very early historical novel doesn't accelerate, it just gathers pace. And that is one of the problems with Scott. The novels take a quite a while to really to get going. And that is what we have done with this redaction, is to make sure that the acceleration begins on page one and does not flag uh, until the last page. And to finish with uh, Alexander McCall Smith, delighted to hear from Sandy that he felt that this is just what was needed to reintroduce Scott to the younger generation who have not been reading him and to make sure that the greatest of our novelists, the first of our historical novelists, has his rightful place. And if this redaction brings anybody back to the original, which I hope it will, then it will certainly have served its purpose. And I'm very grateful to the Sir Walter Scott Club of Edinburgh for this opportunity to set out in, in, in some summary uh, what we have been about with the redaction of Ivanhoe. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention.